Hi, everyone. Let's uh, get down to our second look at Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. Uh, I have on the whiteboard behind me uh, some definitions. These are Greek words. So if you don't recognize them and think, what on earth is that? Um, these are Greek words that have been transliterated into English. So English uh, uh, spelling letters, but uh, Greek words. These are words that Aristotle, when he talks about tragedy, and he does this, uh, we're not going to read Aristotle's poetics uh, in this class, although it's relevant. It's just we can't do everything, and it's, uh, it's a little off the beaten path to bring that in here. But I do want to speak briefly about that. In Aristotle's poetics, and I think I mentioned this, but I, maybe I didn't, and it doesn't hurt to reiterate uh, in any event. Uh, he spoke of this tragedy in particular as the tragedy, uh, the best tragedy in his opinion. And uh, critics have wondered to some degree why that is, and I speculated on why I thought that it was the case. And it does seem to be related to the, the idea of um, his notion of what human nature is, and the most important thing in human life is, and that, that is to know the truth. Uh, that's what Plato's understanding of it, to un understand things in their ultimate form. That's the philosopher's ideal. And this play seems to relate to that because we have a man renowned for his insight, namely Oedipus, who is nonetheless blind to the truth, the truth about himself. And not only is he blind to it, he is resistant to come to the conclusion but Everybody knows the truth before Oedipus. The audience knows, the other, play, uh, the other actors know, he's the last one to know. And he, to some degree, it seems to me, although he doesn't make this connection explicit, is giving us something like the allegory of the cave uh, in Plato, which we'll look at uh, next time. And by the way, it's not on your syllabus. I will provide that online on a link. Uh, in Book 7 of Plato's Republic, he gives us the, this analogy, and, and you can tell me whether you think it's appropriate when, you, when you've read it. But the idea is that people actually don't want the truth. They can't handle the truth. They are resistant to it. It's painful for them to see the truth about themselves. And uh, they actually will persecute those who tell them the truth. Now, this is obviously um, a theme of Western literature. It's a theme of, of the Bible, for that matter. God's prophets are those who tell their people the truth, and they get persecuted for it, and indeed executed for it. And that includes, uh, above all, the Lord Jesus, who told people the truth, and nothing but the truth. And he was executed precisely for that. And it, as it turns out, and this was the great... Um, extraordinary gift of grace, he died for them, the ones who wanted him dead. He died for them. Now, that's a huge difference there. But Aristotle used these terms uh, in reference to the tragedy. And the reason I'm giving them here is not because I just like trotting out my knowledge of Greek. It's these terms have been passed down into the critical tradition and are used repeatedly by other writers. And even in uh, newspapers to this day, you'll read some of these terms, like this one, hubris. You will see that one. You will see catharsis, perhaps, cathartic. Um, you have a catheter sometimes in, in medical practice. It, it, it purges. So those two terms are used. Hamartia you might recognize as well, but probably not. But it is the, one of the words used for sin in the New Testament. And so in your studies in New Testament, you might come across this word. I would have thought you would. And hamartology, the study of sin, is uh, an area. But what it, let me just define some of the terms as Aristotle uses them. And um, you hopefully will acquire them in your own vocabulary and use them uh, appropriately. So let me say a bit about this. Now, I did talk about last time how Aristotle's notion of a tragic hero was somebody who was of high station or of high estate. He had to be a king. He had to be an aristocrat. He had to be somebody who was our superior in rank 
and uh, also in ethical character, but particularly in rank. He had to be somebody of a high estate, an aristocrat, somebody born uh, in, to a station in life that is above us, so a member of a royal family. And the reason for this is that uh, the tragic hero is going to fall. And we sense the fall more keenly when it's somebody who is even better than us. Because we make the implicit comparison, if that person can fall, so can I. It's not that the, the high born are particularly prone to falling. The, the implication is that all people are prone to the same problems that Oedipus has. All people. If even the highborn, who seem exempt from human cares sometimes because of their wealth and privilege, can fall, then, then so can I. So, but we sense this most and we see it most keenly in a person of high estate. So tragedies always have as their hero a, no, a nobleman of some variety. So that's the first feature, but that's not here yet. But he, I mentioned that last time. But this tragic hero is fallible, and this is where this comes in. He has a weakness, a blind spot, if you will, and he makes an error or a transgression. And as I say, in the New Testament, uh, this word hamartia is translated as sin, but that's not what it means here, strictly speaking. The word hamartia in uh, classic Greek is often used in archery. So when somebody shoots an arrow at the target and misses the mark, that's a hamartia. You missed the mark. You didn't hit, not only did you not hit the bullseye, you missed the target. That's a hamartia. Think of that as in relation to sin. What's the mark? What, what are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to acknowledge God and worship him. But you don't do that. And that's a missing the mark. Now, it's, as I say, it's only the one of the words that the New Testament uses to describe sin. But here it's a missing of the mark. He doesn't do what he's supposed to do. He overreaches. He transgresses in some way. In what sense? Or it's a tragic flaw sometimes. It's uh, referred to as this hamartia. What's the flaw here? Well, it's, it's um, probably that he claims godlike capacity. It's connected to, in other words, his hubris, which is almost always just translated as pride. Here is a, let's just call it a tragic flaw. But it's associated with pride. Now, what's the pride here? It's the presumptuousness to know better than the gods. Right? And in this case, he knows better than Tiresias, the spokesman for the gods. The blind prophet, the man renowned for his wisdom, this man, Oedipus, seems to think he knows better. And it's been demonstrated, and it's obvious to everyone's eyes that he couldn't possibly be the man who murdered his father and married his mother, right? He can't see it himself. How is it possible? I, I fled my mother and my father. I couldn't possibly have done this. This is ridiculous. And Tiresias is pretty much, we will come to it when we look at the text, pretty much stating openly, and in the end does state it openly, you're the problem. You're the one who's brought this on him. And he thinks that he's trying, it's just abuse. He's being abusive. He's stating the truth. He sees it as pure abuse. You're just saying this because you don't like me, or you're trying to bring me down, you're trying to destabilize me. You're not telling the truth. <clears throat> so it's related to his pride. Also, Aristotle will observe in a tragedy, there is something called catharsis. Now, catharsis is a purging. And Aristotle, a purging of what? Now, these days, they say a catheter is used of a purging of, of uh, poison, toxins in your blood, and so forth. They use a catheter for that. It purges. But here, it's referring to something else. What is it purging? Aristotle mentions two things in particular. He talks about pity and fear. And now he's not talking about the character in which it is. He's talking about the response in the audience. This, so this is the uh, moral function of tragedy on the audience. A, a tragedy purges the audience of pity and of fear. Now, this is a complex uh, thing. And I, I have done a, 
a podcast with a former colleague and friend of mine, and we talked about this at, at greater length, and I don't have time to go into it today. But it's, I don't think it's merely emotional release. So you're just getting it out there. And these days, cathartic is used in this way. Like you need to scream at the trees to let it out, like emotional release. I don't think that's what Aristotle means. It's purging of the very things that make us uh, human in some ways. He wants us to be more like the gods, does Aristotle. He wants us to be perfect. This will purge us of pity and fear. But I'll, I, as I say, it's, it's too difficult a, a topic for me to get into what he means by this because it's, it's widely dispu disputed and, and no agreement amongst critics has been received. But this word catharsis is definitely there and you will see this over and over and over in later writers. Uh, but the key point, and this is the one I talked about last time, and this is why this particular play is so influential, it, it's about recognition and knowledge. And the moment in the play when there is a recognition, Oedipus recognizes who he is, finally. And the peripatia happens right with it, and this is a turning around. Turing. Turning. <coughs> Turning around. There's this revelation of a fact that had not yet been known which will reveal the identity of the person. This is a play about identity. Oedipus's identity. Who are you, Oedipus? His name is Oedipus. We're told in the text that it, he got this name because it, it has connotations of of a swollen foot. Pus from uh, the Greek word for uh, foot, pedos. Uh, if you go to a, a podiatrist, you get, it's a foot doctor, right? Iatris is doctor, podiatrist. So uh, the, the word Oedipus, this sounds like swollen, a swollen foot. That's one of the suggestions. It also sounds like the This is in Greek. Uh, Oidapu. I'll transliterate. Oidapu. Question mark. Oida. Third person, singular, aorist. What do I see? What do I know? That's what it means. Oida is I see or I know. First I see. Second I know. Second connotation. I see what? I know what? So his name is a riddle. He goes around claiming to know who he is and what other things are. He doesn't even know who he is. He's a riddle to himself. His name could have the connotations of being the very thing that the play is about. What, is, what does he see? What does he know? He claims a great deal. He's ignorant of that. And again, the, the irony of this is exemplified in his ability to solve the, sphinx, the riddle of the Sphinx which began with that riddle, which he solved. You know, what goes around four feet in the morning, two in the afternoon, three in the evening? Well, it's a man. That man will be Oedipus, who begins, we hear in the play, as a, a, a baby with the swollen feet. At this point, we meet him in the full light of day when he's blind as a bat, and he will leave the stage <coughs> blinded. He blinds himself. He takes out his eyes when he finds out. When he recognizes who he is, at that point, he blinds himself. Because it, and it exemplifies who he is. He's a blind man. He's no man. He's not what he said he was. So the turning or the peripety, as it's sometimes presented in English, that turning around is the point when he blinds himself in the play. It's the op the 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 play has had the opposite effect to the one the character intended. At the moment he recognizes that he is the one who has brought this great curse on the city of Thebes. He then goes off stage, blinds himself. There's the recognition followed by the reversal. So the man who claimed he could see is now blind. It goes in a completely different direction. By the way, the exact reversal of what happens when 
uh, a person comes to faith in God. People are by nature fleeing from God. They have their backs turned to him. They think they're hiding. They think that he's not there. When, a per when God calls a person to faith, they, and he, he calls them to repent. And the word repent means turn around. They only turn around when they hear the voice to tell them to turn around. Then they do turn around. They go, they go to a point of recognition at the very point when they turn around. But up to that point, they're blind even though they think they can see. God's not there. I can't see him. All right, so there's this ex extraordinary connection with this, with the Greek view of tragedy, which is antithetical to the Christian message in some ways. But it, it, it leans on similar ideas and understandings. I just find it really interesting and quite profound. Comments or thoughts before I get, go to the play now, but I just wanted to say a little bit about Aristotle and his, uh, the, the words which he uses to describe the key points in tragedy, but particularly this tragedy. This is what makes this tragedy so wonderful in his view. Yes? I'm just interested in the Greek word, was it? Which one? Uh, like, uh, Oedipu? Was it created after the story of Oedipu? No, no, no. This is the, the Greek word, oida, is the Greek word for, I, for seeing. And first person singular, aorist, is literally oida. I see. And pu is the uh, interrogative par particle for um, how, I think, or what. I see what? Or I see how? I mean, I'm speculating here because his name is Oedipus, yeah, yeah. but it sounds a lot like that. And it is a play on words. You get this in, um, in he biblical Hebrew as well. There's a lot of word play. It sounds like this. And to an, an original audience, who uses these words all the time, it sounds enough like it, they might be thinking that, and maybe he's thinking about it, and maybe it's just overly clever on my part, I don't know, but. But it's interesting that it, and it, it's so much a part of the man who claims to see doesn't, can't see and doesn't know. And it's the whole tragedy of the book, so. The whole, and the whole, but the, the reason this book is so profound is it's not only about Oedipus, it seems to be about human nature. There's something about human nature that's being articulated here. And Aristotle connects it to the, uh, the idea of knowledge. I think it's m even more than what Aristotle thinks. It's not only about knowledge, I think it's also about the blindness of sin. But I don't want to out Aristotle Aristotle here. It just seems that that is the case here. So. Uh, back to the, uh, where we left off last time. So there's the three stages of man. Uh, and we had Creon uh, entering the stage. Creon, his brother-in-law. Uh, uh, actually, his, um, so Jocasta's brother. So it's actually his uncle, but never mind. It's a, he doesn't know that. Um, comes in and he has gone out to find out um, something that Oedipus had sent him to find out about. And he is going to take part in the uh, two searches. One, he's going to search for the murderer. Now that we know that it's a murderer who's caused the plague to come on Thebes, we need to find who that murderer is because otherwise the plague will continue and Thebes will be destroyed. So he's going to try and find who the murderer is at the same time, he's going to put, be put a little later on, rather, he's going to be put on another quest, which is to find out who Oedipus is. And these two uh, quests will be related. Um, I did talk about the chorus, right? And the function of the chorus and what the chorus... No? Okay, so very briefly, there is the chorus, though you remember I talked about it on the stage. They go around, they dance, they go in a circle and a counter circle, and there's a chorus leader and, and they, they're sort of singing and chanting at, at sections in there. That's the role of the chorus. But the chorus represents the city itself and its reaction to it. Now remember, this doesn't mean the assembled gathering that are watching the play. It, they, they are represented by the chorus to some degree. So they see on stage a representation of themselves. And so it's this, uh, it, it has this, uh, it's almost a collective priesthood. 
it, and they seem to represent a bond between the gods and, and mankind. And they appeal to the gods repeatedly. So in one, is it 154? They appeal to the, no, 155. So in the uh, chorus here, it's presented, where is it? Yep, there it is, 151 or 2. And the chorus is singing, and there's a strophe and an antistrophe. The strophe is a turn, and the antistrophe is a counter turn. So they're going along stage in one direction, and then they go back in the other direction for the antistrophe. So it's choreographed, if you, if you will. And when they sing that, they appeal, uh, 155, to the Delian healer. He says, We're, uh, what was the phrase? What is the, most, the, what is the sweet spoken word of God from the shrine of Pitho, rich in gold that has come to glorious Thebes? I am stretched on the rack of doubt, and terror and trembling hold my heart, O Delian healer. And I worship full of fears for what doom you will bring to pass, new or renewed in the revolving years. Speak to me, immortal voice, child of golden hope. And then in the antistrophe, they call on Athena, but they first call upon Apollo, the Delian healer. They call upon the one who's destroying them to also be the healer. And then they appeal to Athena, and then they appeal to Artemis, the huntress, various gods. They call to the gods, so they, the chorus is uh, like a priest does function for the city, but at the same time is, is appealing directly to the gods for healing here. And the chorus is expressing the emotions of the city here, and to some degree Oedipus's, because again Oedipus says that he feels their pain. Uh, but they also universalize the experiences. Now, Oedipus wants to get to the bottom of the uh, mystery of what is plaguing them, but, th but this is part of probably his, his hubris, is that he wants to do by his own powers the powers of reason. He is dismissing prophecy. He's not doing what the chorus is doing. He's not calling upon the gods to help him. He is doing it as a scientist, if you will, or as the, we said last time, the CSI. He's going to investigate or find out the cause. And the chorus seems to be aware of his, uh, the limitations of human wisdom when they appeal to the gods. They need help here. But let me come to a section 250 thereabouts. And this wonderful ironic section, and I will pick it up where. Uh, he's speaking of the man who's done this. Let's take 236. He's, uh, Oedipus says, I forbid that man, whoever he be, my land, this land where I hold sovereignty and throne, and I forbid any to welcome him or give him greeting or make him a sharer in sacrifice or offering to the gods, or give him water for his hands to wash. I command all to drive him from their homes, since he is our pollution, as the oracle of Pytho's god proclaimed him now to me. So I stand forth a champion of the god and of the man who died. Upon the murderer I invoke this curse, whether he is one man and all unknown, or one of many, may he wear out his life in misery to miserable doom. So he curses the murderer. If with my knowledge he lives at my hearth, at my fireplace at the center of my home, I pray that I myself may feel my curse. Irony. If he lives at my home, I pray that I myself may feel my curse. Okay? <laughs> On you now, he speaks outwardly, but that, that moment of irony, I spoke about the dramatic irony uh, uh, that is uh, so characteristic of this, and I'll continue on reading here, and you'll see that it deepens. On you I lay my charge to fulfill all this for me, for the God and for this land of ours destroyed and blighted by the gods forsaken. Even were this no matter of God's ordinance, it did not fit you so to leave it lie, unpurified. Now he's directing himself to the chorus here, who represents the city. You let this injustice be unaddressed. It was not fit. 
for you to leave it lie unpurified since a great man is dead a king indeed you should have searched it out since i am now the holder of his office and have his bed and wife that once was his and had his line not been unfortunate we would have children in common but fortune leapt upon his head because of all these things i fight in his defense as for my father and i shall try all means to take the murder of laius the son of labdacus the son of polydorus and before him of cadmus and before him of agenor so the irony is thick and deep he does it as if it were for his father he does it uh, on behalf of right so it's it's clear and obviously referring to him but he has no idea that it is he does it as if it's the case well it is the case and we the audience already knows this so this is what i talk about the discrepant awareness the audience knows already who oedipus is because the story is famous but the character oedipus has no idea so that this is the irony that awareness that the character lacks because he's blind and we who see it now when we see him and it's a play about human nature further as aristotle says then we also think about ourselves how ignorant are we we think we know who we are we act as if we were gods as if we were the masters of our fate and yet we are totally dependent on things outside of ourselves how is that like us how resistant are we to learn this truth anyway so terrific irony there uh, he does show some respect for divine authority because he invokes Tiresias and the prophets. Now, let me say something about Tiresias, and I didn't say this when we met him in the underworld, in the Odyssey, very briefly. <coughs> Tiresias, we already know, is blind. We already know he's a prophet. How did he become a prophet? Where did he come to this great insight? Well, um, he once saw, and this is, th this is to some degree legendary, and there are various legends surrounding Tiresias. If you look them up on Wikipedia or the internet, you'll see various stories, and they're from different sources, there, there are different stories. But he saw two snakes copulating, and he struck them with a staff. This act changed Oedipus the man into Oedipus the woman. Don't ask me. If you do this, it won't happen to you, I trust. Like it don't, uh, but that's what happened. And so now he knows not only what it's like to be a man, but also what it's like to be a woman. Comes across them later on, years later. Another, you would have thought he would have learned his lesson, or maybe he did learn his lesson and said, I'd rather be a man. So he strikes the snakes again, turns back into a man. Okay. So now he knows what it's like to be a man. He knows what it's like to be a woman. This is part of his wisdom. Uh, is that they're, they're a different way of looking at things. So he knows the wisdom of both sexes. Well, he's an androgynous figure, in other words. And you will find, and if you look into this, you will find that in ancient paganism, the shamanistic figure is often an, an androgynous figure. Or a hermaphrodite, if you want to use another term. Hermes and Aphrodite, the two gods. Uh, he was also, um, so this is an aspect of, of, of him and what is odd and slightly disturbing is that he is this figure that doesn't seem to fit either of the two sexes. And so there's something unnatural about him. He's neither nor, not this nor that. And that gives him insight into human nature that others seem to lack. And as I say, if you look at ancient pagan priesthoods, the, andro the androgynous figure is the human ideal, which probably begs the question of why it's becoming the ideal in our day again and our descent to paganism. But that's another topic and an off topic here. But I just note it and it, it's of interest. But he, but, so he is the man who is the uh, prophet here, and he is blind, struck blind for another 
uh, transgression. He saw one of the goddesses naked and was struck blind for it. Never mind. So lots of Tiresias, poor Tiresias, he goes around doing random things and gets struck blind for it and is given the gift of wisdom and insight for that. But Oedipus calls upon Tiresias because as he says, line 300, he says, Tiresias, you are versed in everything, things teachable and things not to be spoken, things of the heaven and earth creeping things. You have no eyes, but in your mind you know with what a plague our city is afflicted. My Lord, in you alone we find a champion, in you alone that that can rescue us. Perhaps you've not heard the messengers, but Phoebus, that is Apollo, was sent in answer to our sending an oracle, declaring that our freedom from this disease would only come when we should learn the names of those who killed King Laius and kill them or expel them from our country. Do not begrudge us messages from birds, augury, looking at the flight of the birds and discerning the God's will or any other way of prophecy within your skill. Save yourself and the city, save me. Save all of us from this pollution that lies on us because of that dead man. We are in your hands. It's a man's most noble labor to help another when he has the means and power. And now Tiresias, what's the response? This could be almost a proverb. Alas, how terrible is wisdom when it brings no profit to the man that's wise. This I knew well, but I had forgotten it, else I would not have come here. In response to the call for him to tell the, and help them get to the bottom of this, he feels the pain that will come from telling what he knows. Now the word prophet in, in Hebrew also uh, refers to those who bear a burden. So to be wise is to suffer. The truth is going to bring suffering because people don't want the truth. Because the truth is that they're sinners and people don't want to be told that they're sinners. Because it, mean, it will mean that they're not their own gods, that they have to follow God and they can no longer do what they want to do. They don't want to hear that truth. And therefore they always persecute the, the prophet. He articulates the exact same understanding here. Now I'm not understanding, it's not, a, it's not a Christian message, but it's still an understanding that wisdom and suffering are strongly linked. And that's why people don't want the truth. Even when it's right in their face, they will flat deny it. And Oedipus, the good man who doesn't have wisdom, who has no insight, who's actually a blind man spiritually, in response to Tiresias, because he says, Tiresias, you've got to help us here. Like, that's the right thing to do. Tiresias, this is going to bring me no profit at all. It's only pain for me. I don't like this. Oedipus, what is this? How gloomy you are now you've come. Tiresias, let me go home. <laughs> it will be easiest for us both to bear our several destinies to the end if you will follow my advice. And now Oedipus is incensed. Here's the man who can solve the problem, save the city, and he wants to go home. What is this? What's wrong with you? What sort of man are you, Oedipus? How dare you? You'd rob us of this gift, your gift of prophecy. You talk as one who had no care for law, nor love for Thebes who reared you. Tiresias, yes, but I see that even your own words miss the mark. Hamartia, they miss the mark. Therefore, I must fear for mine, my words. So now we have the two prophets and they're, they act like foils for one another. This is a word from, from drama uh, in Shakespearean theater. There are two characters that are very similar and they're meant to uh, be contrast to one another. We see them beside one another. We see how one, uh, we can see the obvious similarity, but now we're to see the difference between the two. Both are prophets. One's reputed for, both are reputed for wisdom actually. One is physically blind, the other is spiritually blind. So this will be come out in the dialogue. And the wise man is the, the man who refuses to tell the truth right here, even though he knows it. And the fool is Oedipus, who claims he wants the truth. No matter what happens, he's even willing to curse the man, even if he lives in his own house. He prays, in fact, that a curse comes upon him. If he knew 
that he was it, he would not pray for such a thing, but he doesn't know. Oedipus is angry because of his lack of knowledge here. He said, for God's sake, if you know of anything, do not turn from us. All of us kneel to you, all of us here, your suppliants. And Tiresias, all of you here know nothing. I will not bring to the light of day my troubles, mine, rather than call them yours. What do you mean? You know of something but refuse to speak. Would you betray us and destroy the city? Tiresias, I will not bring this pain upon us both, neither on you nor on myself. Why is it you question me and waste your labor? I will tell you nothing. Okay, so that's how he begins. He's obstinate. He won't tell. He's a bit like the prophet Jonah. Doesn't want the burden of being the prophet and having to tell the people, but he's different from the prophet Jonah. It's not because he hates Thebes, whereas Jonah actually hates the city of Nineveh. He wants them destroyed, so he doesn't want to do the task of the prophet. He's worried about what they'll do. He knows that they'll repent because that's why God sends his prophets. He sends them to get people to repent and turn around. He's afraid they're going to repent. Whereas here, this man, uh, Tiresias, is simply selfish. I'm going to suffer for this, and no good comes of it. And unlike the God of Scripture, these gods intend to destroy and curse, and there is no blessing in it at all, and he sees that. There's nothing in it for him, nothing but pain. And so that, that opening dialogue, the, the, cha the sort of contrast between these two men, these two men reputed for prophet, prophecy, um, is going to play out. So this is the first scene in which the two are brought together, and we can see that it's an extreme conflict. Uh, a man who is blind with genuine knowledge and a man who can physically see but is totally ignorant is going to be reversed at the point of recognition because at that point Oedipus will blind himself and walk off stage. He becomes like Tiresias and now he knows the truth. Is he happy for it? No, he is not. Is Tiresias happy about it? No, he is not. He's gained nothing. He's, what he said at the outset was entirely cr true. And he would rather shield him from the truth. We will find that all the characters will do this, even his mother when she finally figures out who he is. She wants to go away and not tell him. In the end, she hangs herself rather than face the reality. So, uh, so but Oedipus totally misconstrues Tiresias' reticence here. And uh, she, he becomes very angry, and his hubris takes over. As I say, his pride, because he assumes the only reason he wouldn't tell him is, a, is um, he's going to benefit from it, but he's not going to benefit from it. Or he hates the city. That's not why he does it. And Tiresias at uh, line 390 comes very close to telling him it out of fury. Out of fury. Um, actually, it's Oedipus speaking there. But he, he's just blinded by anger even. So it's, it's, let me just look at that section 390. Tell me, where have you seen clear? Because now he's not only going to say, you're not telling us, but he's going to dispute that he even is a prophet. So now it just becomes purely abusive. He says, where have you ever seen clear, Tiresias, with your prophetic mind? When the dark singer, the Sphinx, was in your country, did you speak word of deliverance to these citizens? Yet solving the riddle then was not the province of a chance comer, it was a prophet's task. So he's building himself up. I'm the real prophet here. You're nothing. You couldn't solve that riddle. You're not a prophet at all. So it becomes very, a very abusive relationship. It was a prophet's task, and plainly you had no such gift of prophecy from birds nor otherwise from any god to glean a word of knowledge. But I came, Oedipus, who knew nothing, and I stopped her. I solved the riddle by my wit alone. 
Mine was no knowledge got from birds. So he, just, he ridicules prophecy and says that he himself is the, so, the fount and source of wisdom. His own just clear-sightedness. And now you would expel me because you think that you will find a place by Creon's throne because that's what he's accusing of him. It's a plot by his brother-in-law to depose him. And he's in league with him. In fact, he may have been involved in the original murder of Leia. So he starts just wild abusive language thrown at the prophet here. And now I, I, I want to draw your attention to one other uh, quite profound uh, speech by Tiresias that is ironic and full of meaning here. And this is Tiresias' response to the abuse, line 413. Since you have taunted me with being blind, here's my word for you. You have your eyes, but see not where you are in evil, nor where you live, nor whom you live with. Do you know who your parents are? Unknowing, you are an enemy to kith and kin in death, beneath the earth and in this life. A deadly-footed, double-striking curse from father and mother both shall drive you forth out of this land with darkness on your eyes that now have such straight vision. Shall there be a place will not be harbor to your cries? A corner of Kitharon will not ring in echo to your laments? Soon, soon, when you shall learn the secret of your marriage, which steered you a haven in this house, haven, no haven, after lucky voyage, and of the multitude of other evils, establishing a grim equality between you and your children, you know nothing. So muddy with contempt, my words and creons, misery shall grind no man as it will you. So you want to abuse me? What are you going to be like? Because he knows who he is and what the God has intended, because Apollo intends to destroy this man. Why? Because he's angry at his parents. This man was born to be a byword for a revolting spectacle of a man, the Oedipus figure. The swollen-footed man who does not know who he is. And Oedipus, of course, doesn't get any of this. And he says, like, he just, this guy's just pouring out abuse. He's talking about and me not knowing who I am and who my wife is and who my father is and who my family is. He says, is it endurable that I should hear such words from him? Go and a curse go with you. Quick, go home with you away from my house at once. I would not have come either had you not called me. I did not know then you would talk like a fool or it would have been long before I called you. I'm a fool then, as it seems to you, but to the parents who begot you, wise. My, your parents called me wise. And he says, what parents? Because he thinks his parents are in Corinth. What parents? Stop! Who are they of all the world? This day will show your birth and will destroy you. Anyway, they go, keep going back and forth. Now, this is... Uh, these little short exchanges are part of the dramatic uh, art of Sophocles as well. Intense emotional scenes are best done in short little dialogues, w one word or one line, right? So there are lengthy speeches when the uh, emotional intensity is lower, but when it's at, its, at a fever pitch, they're short one line back and forth, which is what happens in arguments as well, right? You don't go on when you're really angry, you don't go on long one page you know, disquisitions on something. You're just like, oh yeah, you are. No, 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 you are. And that's the equivalent here, right? Angry. So it fits, it's uh, suitable to the stage and reflects uh, human actions. So there's an enormous gulf between appearance on the one hand and reality on the other. Yes? No, the, the brachologia, the, the, the short little exchanges, that's just 
tragic or, or uh, dramatic. Um, it's used by dramatists all over. But he employs it well here. No, what, what, as I say, what is distinct about Sophocles is that he makes this play, the play about Oedipus and about Thebes, which is notorious, he makes it about knowledge and the recognition, and that's what makes it so powerful and profound. It's, it's clear, I think, from the telling that it is the case. So he, he, he repeatedly refers to the eyes, and the eyes are almost always associated in Western, the Western mind, I'm not sure about the Eastern, but with, with reason. He, the person who can see can also reason. That's the means of reasoning. I can, I can see so I can think. But of course, these are a prefiguration for the blindness that will come. So there's a real gulf, a huge gulf between appearances and the actual reality. And events will unfold to slowly remove the layers of the appearances will be stripped bare till all that we're left with is the horrifying reality which nobody could ever, could ever have fathomed. 